Uh, I don't know. I, you know, there's no roadmap. There's no owner's manual with how to be a program director because nobody teaches you how to do uh, how you're supposed to really. Th there's no manual on conducting air check sessions with your jocks. Right. Plus, you're being elevated from the position where you're a jock and all your friends are jocks. And so you're all on the same level. Well, suddenly I was promoted to music director and then program director. So now you can't be friends with these people anymore because now you're their boss. But I also didn't know how to handle their talent and constructive criticism and all that kind of stuff. I had to learn very quickly. There's nobody to teach you that stuff. You got to just learn that shit. Good. So, um, no, I wouldn't say it was fun. It was a learning experience. I'm glad I was in that position because I think that we made common sense decisions about programming that other people wouldn't have made. Uh, we, I think we had some good talent and we utilized that talent. And, and, but yeah, not everybody would have made those decisions. Um, I was glad I was in that position to do that. But I don't think it was a lot of fun because we're all worried about the numbers. Yeah. We had to worry about yeah. the ratings all the time. And it wasn't even every week as it is now. It was every quarter, you know, we had to wait for the book to come out. Um, yeah, it was it was nerve wracking, and it destroyed me. And I left eventually because, uh, in addition to everything else, and don't forget, we were broadcasting from a from a bunker in Tijuana, so we had to drive down to Tijuana every day to do our air shifts. So we would leave the studio, and we would leave the offices of ninety one X and drive down forty minutes south of the border and find our way up this hill with no signs <laughs> and random dead dogs on the corners and find this little cutout that had a cobblestone road that went up a hill. And on the top of the hill was this building and there's an antenna back there. <laughs> and that's where we broadcast out of. Believe me, going to Tijuana to do an air shift, this is something you tell your grandkids about. This is not something everybody does every day. Go and cross the border to another country to do an air shift. It was it was pretty unique. So there was a lot of that. And then the final year that I was there, they made me do mornings, which I didn't want to do. Not only that, we had to sign on at 530, not 6, which means that we had to meet at the station, get in the minivan at what, 530? Five, I don't know. We left San Diego at 4 to make sure that we could get down there by 530, and it's not even a long commute. But you had to understand that once you cross that border, you're at the mercy of whatever happens down there. And you're an American citizen and it's not your country. Yeah. Let me just say that. So when when, you know, and they used to pull over Americans left and right. Um, for whatever. And they all uh, we got word from, you know, headquarters that if you ever get stopped by the police of the federales and they ask what you're doing down there, you're on vacation. Do not, under any circumstances, tell them that you work in Tijuana for a radio station because it's not kosher. They don't understand it. It's some weird deal happened to allow greasy Americans like us to broadcast from south of the border. That's a whole different podcast. That's something else. <laughs> but so we were told never to admit that we work there. So you got to understand that this ride back and forth. And then you had the border crossing to deal with because on mm -hmm. the way back, everybody's trying to get across the border. So there were times when on, on character, I mean, for some unknown reason, the border was light and we'd zoom back across and get back to San Diego in like a half hour, 40 minutes. But most days you get down to the border line and it was an hour yeah. just to get back into the country. And then another 25 minute ride to the station. So my day was very long. It was a hugely long day, 5.30 to like 4 in the afternoon. It was basically almost a 12-hour day. And it, that finally got to me. I couldn't do it anymore. I, I always w wondered about, because Signal doesn't just go to California. It goes into Mexico. Did you ever yeah. think of the audience in, in Mexico that could hear? Yeah, yeah, and we did have them. I mean, kids came up to the station. They knew where it was. They wanted bumper stickers. We kept piles of bumper stickers by the door of the studio and TJ to give to the kids that would come by. Yes, there was an audience in Tijuana. Definitely. So, mm -hmm. um, in fact, 
in the very early days, because we didn't always like know what lyrics the songs contain, um, there were a couple of bad apples, a couple of bad eggs. And our chief engineer, Eduardo, was also the guardian of all things uh, Mexican FCC. Yes, they have an FCC. Mm -hmm. They're very strict, and they don't like obscenities on the air in any form. And um, we had to be careful about that. There were a couple of times where, with a couple of songs, Eduardo came to me and goes, hey, uh, I don't think we can play this down there. It's not a good idea. I said, okay, done. Take it out. I'll take. Oh. Good to have. Yeah. Eduardo in our lives. Yeah, yeah. He, he was great. Yeah. One time, uh, our transmission cable caught fire, and I helped him change the transmission cable. Yeah. These are things that, again, on my resume, not many people have done. Not many people have stood in the dark holding a flashlight while the chief engineer is holding this coaxial cable that's like, you know, just stick around. You can't tell. It's huge. It's like the cable to your VCR, but honey, I blew it up to like 10 times the size. And you're doing the same thing where he's got tin snips and we're cutting it open, exposing the wires, putting it up there. And by the way, we're off the air this whole time. <laughs> There were a lot of adventures. Was it a lot of fun at the time? Not necessarily fun, but great experience. Adventure. I mean, all the things that we have. What an adventure. Unbelievable adventure. But full of hassles, you know. Like, hey, what happens when your new midday guy who's from England, you hire him and he comes down uh, just to see where the station is, right? With the program director and I'm on the air. And the program director brings him in so he knows how to get up to the station the next day. We all have to follow Jock for the first week because you don't know how to get up there. It's all crazy, windy streets with no signs. So if you don't know how to get there, you're fine. <laughs> so the new English guy that we just hired was brought down to see the studio, check everything out. Here's the, the way to get up the hill and whatnot. PD takes him back in his car. They get to the border. And the guy at the gate says, hey, how are you doing? What citizen uh, are you country? The standard answer is you just say U.S. and they wave you on your way, right? Don't say anything else. So Jimmy G says U.S. And then the guy looks at Steve West. And he goes, what citizen are you country? And he goes, Steve goes, oh, I'm from the U.K. And uh, I just got hired to work down <sighs> here at a radio station. So... <laughs> the guy goes, oh, great. Can I see your green card, please? Mm. Can I see your visa? Mm -hmm. Steve West does not have a green card. He's just some crazy Muppet-looking character who was living in uh, North County someplace. I forget where he was. He was um, he's working at his station on the coast, some other place. And um, he didn't have a green card. So the guy at the border takes his visa and he stamps it, denied, right there. He takes his, his visa away, stamps it, denied, maybe he returned it to him. And so they were not allowed into the country. So after looking at where he's about to work the next morning, they go back and his car is in San Diego and all his belongings are in his car in San Diego. He's not allowed to re-enter the country. Steve West cannot go back to San Diego. So he's Only, living in the studio. <laughs> so he had to get himself an apartment down by the bull ring by the sea. And he got himself a little apartment and he had to stay there for, I don't know, like almost a year because John Lynch had to get an immigration lawyer to figure out this nonsense. All of a sudden, our new guy cannot leave Mexico to come back to to San Diego to live or have his stuff or anything. He's living in Mexico. <laughs> and he's sitting on the roof of his little tiny apartment. And you know how English people are like white and pasty? And he's a ginger anyway. <laughs> he got so tan. I've never seen an Englishman this brown in my life. Um, eventually he made it back, but it took, he had to fly back to London from Tijuana to go get reinstated in London, to then come back to the States, to then have the ability for him to go back and forth across the border. It was years of nightmare. I can't tell you. It was just crazy. 
how Steve became like a, a local resident of TJ. Guy from England. Just wanted to do an airship. Couldn't go back to the country. I'm sure, crazy. He, I'm sure he says that's the best 